For those of you who, who are visiting, I never do things the same way twice. <laughs> and I always bring the strangest things, and I don't know, I shake it up quite often. <coughs> and tonight, this is, I, I qualify, every single time I speak, I qualify that I'm just gonna tell you what the Lord told me to say. Because that is who I am, and that's what I want to be, because then the blame's not on me, you can take it up with him. <laughs> so tonight, would you please look at James chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 2, and I'm reading from the Amplified Version because I just love the way it expounds things. It's my favorite version. I'm going to start by asking God to take over. <laughs> Father, I thank you for every opportunity to be with your people, to worship to worship you, Lord, because you are so very worthy. And I love to sing about you. I love to sing for you. I love to sing to you. But I also love your word. It's exciting. It's thrilling. And it's not fair that you always give me more, more, more in a few little verses than I could possibly cover in one sermon. But I am thrilled, thrilled, Lord, with what you showed me this time and with the privilege of delivering it. Thank you. Thank you for filling my mouth now, keeping my mind focused and on task, and helping me to deliver your word with joy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for overriding what I had planned and steering me in the direction you have. I appreciate it. I love your correction, and I am so grateful to have the privilege to speak to your people. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Bless our time now with your holy presence. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. So I'm going to start in verse 2. Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Now you might stop and think, joy? Trials? In the same sentence? Well, there is joy. Go on to verse 3. In the Amplified it says, be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. Now when you're in trial, and you're in trouble, inner peace is what you're looking for. Yes. Verse 4. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect, which just means holy, and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. Mm, thank you, Lord. If any of you lacks wisdom, to guide him through a decision or circumstance, he is to ask of our benevolent God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. Isn't that, that's assuring. Beautiful, beautiful. Now God showed me to do this because I have this version. I don't know what your versions will read like, but he said, put those thoughts together. Verse three, be assured Verse 5, wisdom, and the end of verse 5, will be given. Thank Isn't that neat? That beautiful. It's beautiful. Pretty simple. Thank it's you. very simple. Be assured, wisdom will be given. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first read through this, I thought, 
I don't like the word fall in verse 2. Fall in various trials. I've, uh, in all of my Christian walk, fall always seemed to me um, like a backsliding, uh, you know, walking away from the faith or, or allowing yourself to sin or choosing to sin. That's what fall always seems to represent in my brain. But the Lord showed me here, what is an actual fall? Mm. It's something you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. You trip. You're not expecting as you're walking along to trip and fall, mm -hmm. right? You get news from the doctor, it might not be what you were expecting, but it could be trouble. Mm -hmm. And those are the two things he connected in, in, as I was reading through this. He said, trouble is something you're going to have in this world all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus said. In this world, you will have trouble, yes. but be of good cheer. Consider it nothing but joy. For I, Jesus, have overcome the world. Amen. I've overcome everything you're going to face. All of it. So be assured that wisdom for your decision and your circumstance will be given. Simple. Thank you, Lord. And encouraging. Yes. yes. So then as I was looking at verse 3, I thought, testing of your faith. And I'd always heard testing. People think in terms of God's giving me the, the, the pass or fail kind of test. It's testing my faith. Well, that's not what God showed me when we were going over this. How many of you like to eat a cake that's gooey in the middle? <laughs> Only if it's lava cake, right? It's supposed to be gooey in the middle and you're expecting that. But if it's a regular normal cake, you're expecting it to be cooked all the way through. Yes. Okay? That's what this means here. It's the proving, the proofing of where your faith is. With a cake, you take a tester, you insert it to see whether or not the cake is fully cooked. Mm -hmm. This testing is the revealing of where you're at with your faith. Are you fully cooked in your faith? Or not quite yet? 160 degrees. <laughs> so, that's what this testing means. The testing, the proving. You see, because when we fall into trouble, it's the unexpected. So that means it's usually something we haven't faced before. It's something we don't know how to walk through. It's something new that we've got to learn all over again how to trust God, how to walk in faith, how to believe Him, how to get through that. That's what he's talking about here. When you find yourself in a new position of trouble that you've never been in before, consider it a joyful moment because you now have opportunity to learn. Learn more, learn better, and it shows you where you are in your faith walk. It reveals to you where you are in your faith walk, walk through the experience. And if you will embrace the trouble with a joyful spirit, it will produce endurance in you. And endurance leads to spiritual maturity, and it leads to inner peace. And when you're in the trouble, getting to the inner peace is really what you want. That's, that's your desire, is getting to the inner peace. Yes. Now, James is telling you something here. And he's doing what's called a drill down. I don't know if you've ever heard of a drill down. But a drill down is it, you, you kind of give a big picture, and then you go a little bit tighter, and you give a lot more detail. Then you go a little bit tighter, and you give all the real pertinent details. And he's doing that here. So he's saying, be assured, you're going to figure out where your faith actually is. You're going to need to learn to trust God in a new way. And then he goes a little deeper and he says, but don't fight it. Mm -hmm. Let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work. And I'm going to insert in there, in you. Mm -hmm. Let the cake tester stab you. Figure out where you are, and if you've got to go back in the oven, let God put you back in the oven. 
Okay? Amen. There's a reason for that. And he goes on to explain. He says the reason you want to do that is because then you become perfect and completely developed in your faith, which is what we all want. It's the growing. Peter said, are you at the same spot where you were when you got saved or have you been growing? Mm -hmm. Have you been maturing? That's what he's talking about here. So you want to let that have its complete work in you. And then you, as, as it completes in you, you become holy. You become more holy, which is the other goal in the Christian life. And then you become completely developed in your faith. And that leads you to lacking nothing. Mm -hmm. Lacking in nothing. And you have strength, and you have courage, and you have boldness, because you've walked through a lot of stuff with God. Now, if you have any kind of spiritual giant that you admire in your life, I can guarantee for you, they've been through this. This is a process, and we all go through it, we all have to go through it. This is the only way for spiritual maturity to come into your life. And for you to walk in spiritual maturity. There is no spiritual giant out there who got this any other way. Nobody got handed with a silver platter sudden spiritual maturity. Mm -hmm. Without having to walk through trials, troubles, and lean on God. And learn how to lean on God. Yes. If you lack the wisdom to make good decisions when you're in your trouble, then ask God. And I love this. Who gives to only his favorites? He gives to everyone. Because God doesn't play favorites. That's right. I'm sorry, John. <laughs> you're not his favorite. <laughs> And I love that, you know, um, just because I get up here and I speak, just because I have a title of a reverend, whatever it might be, doesn't make me God's favorite. If I have wisdom in my life, it's because I ask for it. Yes. Do you want wisdom in your life? Ask for it. It's that simple. Because he doesn't play favorites. And I love this. He gives to everyone generously because he wants you to have wisdom. He wants you to go through the process. He wants you to be successful at it because he wants you to be close to him. He wants to draw you into him. So this is exactly what he wants. So he's going to make sure your pathway to him is one that you can get through and get traveled to him on. He's going to help you do that. It says here that he does it without rebuke or blame. <laughs> rebuke and blame, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Yes. Well, if you hadn't done that, well, you wouldn't be in this trouble if you'd listened to me way back there. Or how come you chose that? That was what caused you to dump into the trouble. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. God doesn't treat anybody that way. You go to him and ask for wisdom to get you through the trouble. And he's just plain going to give it to you. I love that. Amen. Now, like I said, James is doing a drill down. Verses 6 through 8 are the harder side of this whole thing. In verse 6 he says, But he must ask for wisdom in faith without doubting God's willingness to help. For the one who doubts is like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wind. For such a person ought not to think or expect that he will receive anything at all from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable and restless in all of his ways, in everything he thinks, feels, or decides. And that's the hard part. When I read this, the first, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was the way I'd always heard it spoken. The person who doubts is going to get nothing from God. And it always had this tone that said God is going to withhold from the person who doubts and that is not what it's saying mm -hmm. that's the way I'd always heard it taught but that is not what it's saying the key is in verse 8 a double minded man mm -hmm. restless in his thoughts his feelings and his decisions this person will not receive from the Lord, not because God's not given it, 
but because God can't break through the restlessness. God can't break through the turmoil because the man is all stirred up. He's in panic. And because he's in panic and he's making emotional decisions and he's running hither and yon and he's trying to get advice from this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy and he's going to everybody that he knows and he's talking about his trouble and before you know it, there's too many thoughts in the mind. Mm -hmm. And he's all stirred up and he can't get quiet. And he can't get still. And because he's not quiet and he's not still, he can't hear. God is giving him an answer but he can't hear it. You see, he will not receive because of the condition he's in, not because God's not giving it. Do you get that? Yes. yes. That was like a light bulb to yes. me this morning when I was reading through this. You know, I studied something else entirely for the entire week, something very deep, very spiritual. Um, and then Saturday morning I got up and I was just sitting alone, quiet with the Lord. And I happened to take a look at some of the songs that John had picked out. And I'd been reading an article and I'd been uh, going through a devotional that I've got. And, you know, just taking time and just letting God speak to me. And he led me to this section of scripture and he said, that's what you're preaching on. Mm, thank you, Lord. And I said, so what was all that that I did all week? <laughs> He said, oh, that was just for you, because <laughs> you needed that. <laughs> he said, but this is what you're speaking on. And then it totally fits with everything John yes. chose for the, for the music. It totally fits with everything Peter has just said as far as communion yes. and everything that he prayed at the very beginning, which is often the way it works here. Because yes. um, we don't talk to one another. Mm -hmm. We don't set it up. We just let God tell us. Um, so he said, speak on this, because they need to know there's a process here. And the process is good. It's for your good, and it leads you to good. Yes. And that's the wonderful thing about it. So in the process, there's some things you need to do beyond just kind of like underlying, be assured, wisdom will be given. Mm. You know, that's awesome mm. to know that I've got a God who hears me and answers. Yes, He's going to give it to me. But beyond that, there's some things we've got to do, some practical things. And the first thing you've got to do when you find you're in trouble, and it's, you know, you need God to move, the first thing you've got to do is give yourself 24 hours and just let it sink in. Don't make an emotional snap decision. Give yourself 24 hours. Then contact someone who is, you, someone you know is spiritually mature. Mm -hmm. Don't go running here and there to everyone you know, talking about your trouble, talking about how panicked you are, how you're so fearful, how this is going to happen or that's going to happen or you don't know what's going to happen. And because the more you do that, the more it stirs up the panic. Yes. Talk to one or two people that you know are spiritually mature who can give you good, solid advice. Then go home and do what they said. The second thing you need to do is you need to shut down all distractions. Mm -hmm. That may mean you'll have to stop watching TV for a little bit. Just, just turn it off. Turn off the radio, get away from the computer, close the scriptures, do, don't do anything. And just begin to talk to God about how you're thinking, and how you're feeling. Yes. And as you do that, write it down. Write it down. Write it down. Or talk it out. And the reason you want to talk it out verbally is because the moment a, a sentence that sounds so big in your head leaves your mouth, sometimes you can look at it when it comes back around and enters your ear and say, oh, that's just silly. Why was I thinking that? Or you might be able to say, wait a minute. God would never do that. God doesn't do that. Why am I thinking that? But if you write it down, what you have the opportunity to, to do is you're, you're purging. You're pulling all that stuff up, and you're getting it all out of your system so it's not just running around and making you crazy. So you're getting it out of your system. And as you're emptying that out, the Holy Spirit now has a place to come in. And the Holy Spirit can bring up to you, to your mind, things that you know of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Little phrases like, 
I will never leave you or forsake you. That's right. Or God is my shield and my refuge. Yes. Be still or and know I'm God. be still and know that I am God. The little things will pop up. And then the thing to do is you write those down. Yes. And for each one of those, you'll notice suddenly you'll realize, hey, wait a minute. All this negative stuff at the top of my page, this is an answer for that. So you can take a big, fat, black marker and cross that one off and say, sorry, that one is not valid anymore because I have this scripture to stand on. Mm -hmm. Go to the Bible, look at the scriptures, find them, pull them out, write them down, and post them everywhere. So that that's what you're looking at, and that's what you're seeing, and that's what you're reading over and over and over and over. And then begin to pray those you. over your life, over the situation, over the decisions you've got to make. And the final thing you need to do is you need to get quiet. Mm. And that is probably the hardest part to do. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but when you stop and you decide you're going to get quiet, suddenly everything needs your attention. And that's the chiming. That's going to come up. That's where you need to start pouring that stuff out. When you know it's a negative thought, just say, cast it off. Say, no, I'm not going to think like that. God says he will walk through this with me because he said in his word that he's never going to leave me, never forsake me. He will be with me to the end of the age. I don't have to feel like I'm alone. I'm not alone in this because God is there. Amen. That's what you start to do. And as you see a negative thought, you can always say to God, yes, I feel that way. But don't feed it. Yes, I feel that way. It's an acknowledgement, but don't feed it. Don't start sweating on it. Don't start dwelling on it. Yeah, I feel like that, God, but I know that you have an answer to that. Yes, I know that I have that. It's, it's the what if, and I can't figure that one out. I don't know what to do about that. I know you have an answer for that. I, I, yeah, I know. I do think that. But I don't want to think that anymore. I want to think what you tell me to think. And as you start doing that, peace will come. Yes. Quiet. And the, the one thing that we don't do in both the North Ameri in all of the North American culture, uh, America and Canada, is we don't know how <coughs> to sit for long periods of time in silence. Mm -hmm. Somehow or other, we think silence is bad. Mm -hmm. Silence is where the Holy Spirit will begin to speak. Because remember, the voice of God is a still, and it is a small voice when it starts. And as you learn to do this when you're in trouble, you learn how to hear God speak to you. And then other things start to become clear. And then you will get your wisdom your, your guidance, because that's who the Holy Spirit is. He's the guide. You'll get your guidance for the decisions that you need to make in the circumstances you found yourself in. And we find ourselves in circumstances for two reasons. Either decisions that we've made, which aren't always good sometimes, and decisions other people make that affect us. And those are the only two places they ever come from, because just think about life. Government has just made decisions. I don't know how many of you know but there's 25% tax on metals right now. Did you know that? Oh. Wow. Steel. Yeah. Donald Trump, President Trump, said, we don't want steel from Canada anymore. So. China. It, Premier? Trudeau. Prime Minister. Prime Minister Trudeau. He retaliated by saying, fine then. We're going to put 25% on anything that comes across the border from the U.S. into Canada. That affects you. Did you know there is a 10% surtax on toilet paper? Oh, yes. yeah. Coffee. Yeah. And the reason I know that is I work in customs. So I have to be aware of these things. So uh, things are changing. And these are decisions people are making that's affecting my life. I cannot buy Folgers coffee anymore. Because it's coming up from the States. It's going to have a 10% surtax on it. And there's no way around it. Somebody else made a decision that affects my life. Yes. How many times does that happen? All the time. 
And that lands us in trouble sometimes, by no fault of ours. If the president of the company that I work for suddenly decided he was going to abscond with all the money and take off, I'd be out of a job. No, no error on my part, decision he makes that affects my life. If I chose to, I don't know, do drugs when I was young and now I'm you know, older, I'm going to deal with the effects of that. That was a stupid decision I made that might land me into trouble later on in life. There are things like that that happen all the time. If I chose to eat incorrectly for 30 years, I'm going to have physical problems. If I didn't get enough exercise, I'm going to be unhealthy, and I'm going to have effects from that. But those are choices I make. So we all are affected by these things. We all have trouble, all of us. And we all need the wisdom that comes from God. So that's the process. Tell a couple of trusted, mature people. Remove all your distractions. Purge all the negative thought. And take long periods of time to be quiet and still so that the Holy Spirit can give you leading, guidance, direction, and help you make decisions that are right. Don't panic. And to that note, I have to share with you a story. How many of you remember the story of Henny Penny? <laughs> chicken Little. Or Chicken Little, yep. One day Henny Penny was picking up corn in the cornyard when whack! Something hit her on the head. Goodness gracious me, said Henny Penny. The sky's falling. I must go and tell the king. So she went on her way and she came across Cocky Locky, and Ducky Daddles, and Goosey Boosey, and Turkey Lurkey, and they all were headed to tell the king that the sky is falling, and they ran into Foxy Woxy. And Foxy Woxy said, where are you going? And they said, we're going to, to tell the king that the sky is falling, and he said, oh, but that's not the way. Henny Penny, you don't want to go that way. I know the proper way. Shall I show it to you? And of course, they all agreed and said yes. And so they all went along till they came to a narrow, dark hole. And this was the door to Foxy Woxy's cave. And if you remember the story at all, they all went in one by one, and every single one of them died because he bit their heads off. Until the very last one. Cocky Locky was the last one to enter, but uh, the couple of bites that uh, Foxy Woxy took of Cocky Locky didn't kill him, and he called out to Henny Penny, and she turned tail and ran off for home. So she never told the king that the sky was falling. And you might say, what does that have to do with James chapter 1? <laughs> well, there's a couple things there. First of all, she found herself in trouble when something hit her on the head. And she panicked and thought she had to tell the king. But luckily, she was smart enough to tell the king, the one person she felt had the power and the authority to do something about it. Mm. Go to the king. Mm. Okay. <laughs>